So, hi everyone. Uh, this is my Twitter account and this link here that you can see. You can already download my all the material I'm going to show. There will be the, the code I'm going to show and the slide source. So you can have a look and play around. You're welcome to open Python and in interactively try the examples I'm going to show you because that's what I will do as well. So uh, I come from um, Italy, but I live in London and I work for this company called Depop. This is just a small advertisement slide where I tell, um, uh, just telling you that we are hiring, we're looking for API developers. And uh, if you're interested, just have a look there, depop.com, jobs. We're using Django, uh, Celery, all the nice things, MongoDB, Postgres, etc., etc. All right, so uh, what are we going to talk about today? So first of all, I'm trying to define what is metaprogramming and why it's useful. Um, then we are going to talk about Lisp a little bit, but not too much, so don't be scared. And then we're going to talk uh, Python, uh, about Python and how some techniques we can use for metaprogramming in Python. So this is the definition I found on Wikipedia about metaprogramming. I don't know if it's the best one, but uh, let's try to go with this one. Metaprogramming is the writing of computer programs that write or manipulate other programs or themselves as their data, or that do part of the work at compile time that would be otherwise done at runtime. So this is kind of still not very clear, but I think we're gonna see now in some examples how this, what this really means. I manipulate the program itself, manipulate themselves. Well, I don't know. I'll show, I'll show you later what that means. So uh, why on earth would you do that? That's the most important question because that sounds really magic and really strange. Um, there are some uh, scenarios where this really makes a big difference. And normally it's, used, it's not really used for performance reasons or for making a better product. It's maybe it's normally just used to be closer to the domain you're working in. So you write an abstraction in a more powerful way and in the end you, re you manage to minimize the line of code you have or you manage to uh, make the whole program more close to your domain and more easy to understand for the people in that domain. So what's the cost of that? Well, uh, it, if you do it well, nothing. If you do it wrong, uh, you might screw yourself up a little bit. So, next slide. Just a, a very small introduction to Lisp. So, it was invented by McCarthy in 1958. So, that was uh, a very long time ago. It's the grandfather of languages, in a way. And what people think about it is that there are lots of parentheses. That's how people see it normally. Uh, there is a reason, however, for all these parentheses. So, and then I'm going to try to show you what it is. This is the simplest possible, well, the simple factorial function. And this is how it's defined. There is a special form defined, which is the way of defining functions, which takes an argument, which is the name of the function, the arguments of the function, and then there is another special form if, which takes three arguments, the, um, the conditional, the then, and the else branch here. And all, th all these things are expressions, uh, S expressions to be precise. Um, I'm going to do a lot of uh, kind of live coding, so maybe I'll try now for the first time to just show you how things actually work. So we go in Emacs here, of course. And I define, this is the REPL for uh, um, SBCL, which is a common Lisp uh, interpreter. And then I here I define factorial. I, co I compute it, everything works fine. Interesting thing to note is that even if I give a very high number, it doesn't blow up like uh, Python would do, even if it's recursive, because it's, um, it's smarter about recursion than Python. So let's continue. So Lisp has very small, very limited syntax. And it's another property which is quite uh, uncommon and not of many languages, which is homoiconicity. That's a very difficult word and uh, um, 
not easy to define, but it in practical means that the program itself is a valid uh, representation of the data. Um, so here, for example, what we have is the computation of the uh, product between the sine of one and the cosine of 2.03. And what this actually means is that it's like setting an expression to a list where the first element of the list is a symbol uh, star, the second element is another list with sign, symbol sign and one and one, and the third is another list with cosine and two, three. And then you evaluate that expression. So why is homo econo, uh, that, that word? It's because you can actually transform and pass around a program and manipulate it easily as it was data. So to make it more, maybe more clear, I try to say how is Python homo iconic? Well, no, but what if, how would it look like if it could be, for example? That might be something, I don't know if that makes sense, but so suppose you can write, suppose this is valid Python, this is a way to define a function. You, oh, you create a list, and then the first element of the list is def, then you have function, then you have arg, and then comma pass. So this is, a list, and this is also how you define a function. It's not true, of course, but that's how what it would look like if it was. So why this, this thing is so important? Well, first, this is just uh, to show how the evaluation is done in Lisp, just to make it clear. As you know, every uh, operator is infix, and then uh, everything is a uh, cons in the end. So you have here uh, the star, the multiplication sign, then you have the two, then you have another uh, branch where you have the plus, the three, the four, and here nil, and nil, because there is no other element in the cons. So why uh, is this uh, property important? Because in Lisp you can make, make a programming to a, a very uh, deep level. You can make uh, using macros. So assume, um, which you maybe haven't seen, but in Lisp to set a, uh, to do an assignment of a variable, you do set q x 10, for example, which sets to the symbol x the value 10. Suppose I want to do something like set uh, 10 to two variables at the same time, like assigning two things to one value in one uh, call. Is that possible? Well, at the moment it's not possible, but what if I write a function so I write this function, the fun set q f uh, x y z, and then I do this. I use this special form program which uh, concatenate to multiple uh, expressions, uh, evaluating them. Uh, but that doesn't work. So we can try it out. Let's see what happens. Where was it? Set q. So now I do set Q to F, I do A, A, well, A, B, and I say 10. And it fails, it says the variable A is unbound. So, well, how, how do I solve it? But that's kind of uh, understandable in a way, because I'm trying to set, to create a special form with the function. So that's not really possible. So, uh, however, if I rewrite this thing with the macro, with, where the only difference is that here I use def macro and here I use this back quote and these commas here in front, instead everything works fine. See, I define the macro, and then I do set q, q, a, b, a, b. Everything works. So what's the difference? The difference seems small, but it's quite relevant because here, uh, this macro uh, is basically uh, creating uh, compile time, a new, um, a new function that will get be templated when you call it. So this is like uh, uh, it takes the symbol, it doesn't try to evaluate it, it doesn't try to evaluate A or B, it just passes it around to this quoted thing, which then gets evaluated at runtime, and this runs normally as it should. So a very powerful technique. Can we do the same in Python? Mm, almost. 
Well, I mean, for to do the, this kind of thing, you we could do something like that, which is horrible, and yeah, almost works. But so basically, you pass two strings like A and B, and then you pass an expression. You evaluate the expression, and then you update the globals with this thing. Like, yeah, it's not even the same exactly, but it kind of works. But yeah, don't do that, of course. So yeah, the, the Lisp uh, prior introduction is over, luckily. We can pass to something more interesting in Python. So uh, what can we do in Python for metaprogramming? Well, we can have uh, function decorators, class decorators, meta classes, and then if you really want to be fancy, you can manipulate the, the after syntax tree. I'm going to show them in order. They are also in order of uh, difficulty in a way. What is a decorator first? The decorator is just a syntactic sugar for a function that modifies the behavior of another function or a class. So this simply means this below. You, you do a at decorator or as the function and the same thing as defining the function and then redefining, assigning it to the return result of the decorator itself. And uh, let's see the first problem that we try to solve with the decorators. Uh, assume I want to measure the time spent in a function and print it out to the standard output and see how long everything takes. Uh, this is a decorator that does it. So it takes the function, it uses this nice wraps decorator defined in func tools, and this is just to make sure that all the like underlying uh, um, attributes like doc uh, and so on get passed correctly and they don't get lost <laughs> along the way. It would work anyway. It's always good to put this. So yeah, and then you define as, uh, an inner function which will call the original one, store the result somewhere, uh, store the time before and after, and then print out the time spent and return the original result. And then here, you return this inner function. Um, you can show this, how, how that works. So now we go to the shell. I open IPython. Can you see in the back? Bigger, maybe? <coughs> Next, okay. okay. Okay, what was it called? Curators time by print. Okay. So now I create another function time at print. Do something timing. Doesn't do anything useful. Then I call this and I get this message here. Function time me um, took. Uh, they should have said something else. Ah, because I changed it before this, the talk, of course, and I made a mistake. <laughs> Yeah, this, sorry. Right, again. Oh no, no, still the same. <laughs> Ah, uh, yeah, 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 thank you. Oh, God. <laughs> All right. <laughs> uh, I can reload the decorators. So does work? No. What? So now, R. No? Just R? 
Okay, let's do, let, I show you the next example, it's more interesting. <laughs> right. Okay, so we have another problem now, still with timing, but slightly different, because I want to know when, I, when I'm implementing something new, like a new feature or, or I change algorithm, uh, I want to know that the new one runs faster than the previous one, but I just, I don't want just to know it once. I want to make sure it's always like that. So I want to have that running in a test uh, somewhere, like an integration test, and say my new fancy algorithm is still faster than the crappy old one after six months of hacking on it and adding things. Um, so, well, uh, I mean, in theory, with the previous approach, we couldn't do that because we were just printing it out, so we can't just check all the time how things look like. Um, but with another decorator, which uh, also changed the signature of the original function, then we can do that. So what I have here is a test to check that the first implementation is faster than the second one. And the way it works is that the new, this decorator here will change the function return values and add the time spent in the function as a second, and as a second uh, return value. And so I do this, I do this for the second one, and then I can check that the time of the first one is less than the time of the second one. So now let's see how we actually implemented them. So still quite simple, actually exactly the same almost. The only difference is that here, we, um, when we do the return, we do, uh, we also add the time here. So this is an interesting case, and the difference is that you can't use it in a import time way, because if you, if you decorate your function in the module like that, then it will mess up everything, because you don't, want, you don't care about the time spent in production, of course. So you can only do that in this way, but it's a perfectly valid thing, as I was saying, since it's just in Tati Sugar, to just uh, replace the function at runtime in this way, and then call it. So let's see if this, I have more luck with this one. So decorators. I need, what was it? It changed. Oh yes, that works. So yeah, see I get a tuple, and uh, the first element is the result, and the second element is the time spent. Very nice. To actually see how things work, huh? it's interesting also to look at the code here of time me. And Yes, and the wraps function did the nice thing to also make sure that the source code that is returned is the original one, not the wrapped, not the wrapped in, a, in the decorator. All right, so another example. This is how you can decorate a class instead. Suppose I want to add always the same method to many classes, and this, I mean, uh, I don't want to go in every class and change it, and I don't want to make a super class to make, to make this. This is another very simple way to do that. You just, uh, this is the test where I have a class which adds a response method, and then when I instantiate this class and I call the response, I get the return I want, the value I want. So this is the simple way you do it, very clear and simple. You just take the class here, you uh, assign to response an anonymous function which takes self and returns this, and then you return the class itself. Yeah, that's all for the creators for now. So let's pass to meta classes. So meta classes is the next uh, like uh, way of doing meta programming in, in Python. It's more powerful and it's more. Uh, it's also a bit more difficult to understand in the beginning. But it's really not that hard, as, as hard as it looks, as I'm going to sh try to show you. So what's uh, um, a meta class? Well, a meta class 
in Python is just the same as a, a meta class tends to a class, like a class tends to an instance. So it's a type of a class. Um, if you create a class in this way here, it's exactly the same thing as doing it in this way with the type function. I'm going to try to show you now a little bit. For example, if I now do this, ah, I forgot to mention in the beginning that all the code I'm showing is a uh, Python 3 um, only. Well, the difference is not many, but yes, if you try to run it on Python 2, it will, it might fail, or it might not do what you want. Okay. So what's the type of C? Type. And then if I try instead to create a type, Let's see what this takes as argument. It takes an object or name, a, a list of bases, and a dictionary. So, for example, suppose I want to create a, a runtime a class like B, uh, which has a, as bases all the object, and then as dictionary I have a, like a class attribute, a 10. Must be a tuple, yes, mistake. Okay, so this is now a class, and I can instantiate the class, and I can access the attribute A. So this is another way of creating classes at one time, and this is how in the, um, in the background it works. Let's see the simplest possible meta class implementation and how to use it. Uh, so we have a, a class simple meta, which subclasses type. And then to use it in our own class, we only need to create class um, subclassing object and then passing meta class equal to simple meta here. In Python 2, it would have been uh, uh, underscore underscore meta class here equal to something, but it's just the same thing. And now uh, let's pass to some more uh, interesting examples, I think. Um, in every ORM or every like, Django framework or so on, it's very easy to define models that um, talk to the database, store data, keep some information about the type and so on and so forth. And this is kind of possible s syntax that is used, which I just made up, but it's quite similar enough, I think. And it looks like uh, uh, magic, but it's not that hard to do it in, in reality. And the simple way to do it in this case, if I want to uh, accomplish something like that, if I don't have meta classes, I could just have a model for this particular case, which takes the argument uh, x and y and then initialize them like that. So, well, I mean, if you, you can do that if you have some very simple scenarios, but if you want to define many models, if you want, it's very verbose because every time you have to declare everything and assign it, there is a lot of boilerplate. And also the very important thing I think is that you have no information about the types and while Python is duck type, uh, Databases are normally not, so you need, still need to have the information somewhere. Um, so how how can we accomplish this kind of very nice thing in Python then? We start by uh, looking at how we can implement um, a field type, so which is this one. So a field type will be a base class for things like integer or string. And you can implement it. Uh, so this is the test that will, this, the requirement for this kind of type. I want to have three different things. Um, I want to be able to, wait a minute. I'm not, this, this is not the right test. Okay, this one is the right test. Ah, oh, sorry, sorry, no. Take it back, this is the next slide. Uh, so this is the, the model I want to have. And these are the three uh, requirements that I have for this model to behave like I want. So I want to be able to create um, an object like this, passing for a sample y, 
uh, and without passing x, x as a default value, y doesn't have one. Um, so I check that after I pass this, y is set and x is also set to, to default value. I want to be able to know that if I pass something wrong, like unknown hello, it will give an exception. And if I pass something of the wrong type, it will always give a type error in this case. So first uh, we can look at how fields are implemented. And here again, there's a requirement for the fields. So if I create uh, an integer where I pass zero uh, as value and the default one, the value will take the precedence. If I try to set at uh, init time something which is the wrong type, I get a type error. And also very importantly, if I in the beginning create the element correctly and then I change the type to something else, and then I also get a type error. So let's say an implementation of fields first, which is not you done using meta classes, but it's done in this way. So the init, um, the most important thing is that we have a, a property here, which has a, a, a also a setter. And this property is the actual uh, representing the value. And whenever you try to set here the value, which is also done at this point, it will always check the type. It checks if the type is not an instance of this base type, which every class uh, will have to define, then I raise a type error. Let's see how is, for example, the implementation of a string or integer. So very simple, here we have a uh, the base uh, class, here is integer, and here is string. So that's all, all you have to do is to define the base type, and if the object you're passing is not an instance of that, then it will give a type error. Yeah. So let's go back now to the model, the model's meta class, and this is the actual, instead, the solution for uh, all this, which fits in the slide, so it must not be that difficult is uh, the solution for the original problem. Um, the way it's done is that I subclass type, as I've done before in the previous example, and then I, um, I override the underscore underscore new method, which is used to, uh, in, during the construction of the class itself, instead of the initialization, initialization of the object like uh, init. Um, and then I get four arguments here. I get the class, I get the name, I get the list of base classes, and I have uh, this important the class dict, which is um, all the, uh, the attributes and methods of the class, basically, which we can modify. So the way, uh, the way I want to do this is basically just replacing the init of the new class that I will create now with another init that will do some extra checks and extra uh, things for me automatically every time. First of all, I loop over the attributes of the class and I check uh, if, the in, if the attribute of the class is an instance of a field, then uh, this is like a field. I just stored it in a dictionary here. And then I redefine an init here, which takes uh, some kwx. So it can take uh, x equal one, y equal two, and so on and so forth. And then it will first of all check if there are some arguments which I pass in that are not known. So if the set of the difference between uh, the, key, uh, the arguments passed and the fields that I found looking, inspecting the class is greater than zero, then uh, give an exception. Uh, otherwise, if, not, if everything is fine, then loop over this and then generate, um, set an attribute to this object self uh, with the, as a key, the um, the, the name of the, the argument, and there's a value, the value which I just now created by calling the class and passing the value. So it sounds more complicated than this maybe, but I try to show 
maybe now uh, how it works. And then after that, the, the important step is that I redefine the init of the class stick to the thing which I already defined here. And then I return uh, um, just the super call. I'm trying to show you just very simple how this behaves, maybe. So if I now, yes, now the only thing I need to do is to define a model in this way, class model, yes, and then I will simply If I define now another model, um, simple two, no. I know import models, sorry. Can't type today. Import from model, and then I define x equal to models string, okay? Now, suppose I want to create an instance of this, but I pass the wrong thing, complaints, and no argument, why? If I pass this, it checks the type, and there's an error. If I pass this instead, everything will work correctly. Oh, sorry. And the interesting thing, if, uh, if I look at the init of this method, it tells me where actually it comes. Oh, no, sorry. If I look at this. Yeah. If I look at the init of the class simple2, it tells me that it comes from here. Function models, meta model, new locals init. So that's where it finds it. All right. Another, another example, which is a bit more simple, is how to, for example, make sure that we always call the super of the init in the subclasses of a super class that we define. Um, I've seen this doing, for example, in the module threading.py. If you forget to call the init, it will blow up and complain. And if you look at the implementation, it's basically just this. It has an initialize false, and in, init, in init it will set initialize true. And in every method that has to be uh, working on an initialized object, it, it, there is this check. So that's a bit annoying, and that's a bit too long maybe to do. So this is what I want, is that I call something, and if I forgot to call the super in the init, it should um, give me an assertion error. And that's it, that's the implementation, very simple. I do, uh, I store the original init somewhere, and then I call it here, I, I replace the init with another init which I'm doing, I call it here, just to make sure I don't lose anything, and then I also add an, asser an assertion looking for a flag variable that is set. So this is kind of doing the same thing, but is in a more generic way. And so all you have to do in your class to use this is to just go um, here. I define a class base, pass in the meta class, check in it. And all I have to do is to define a flag variable equal var. And this is a variable that I know that I always set in the init uh, here. So if something tries to subclass base and forget to call init, this here will be not set, and then this will uh, give an assertion <coughs> error. Yep. And last thing I want to show very quickly is that just you can do even much worse than that if you want. And this is a, a very simple function that um, analyze the AEST of a given function, uh, parsing it, parsing the source, and then trying to find out uh, a particular value, a string, and replacing it with something else. Let me sh show you the actual example. It's probably easier to understand. This is um, 
this is the function here, which I want to replace at runtime. And what I want to replace is to remove the hello from the string. So, and this is what it's doing. I call it, I exact this, um, the return of this, and then I call it again. So what is going to happen? Is that, oh no. Yeah, the first time it calls with hello world, the second time only world. All right, everything works fine. Um, so the thing is that, of course, this is very hard coded and it's not really uh, the good idea, but in theory, a AST is just a tree, so you can traverse it in any way you want. So you can look for all the things that look like strings that have this content, or you can look for all the, you can do anything you want, and you can put that in a decorator, or you can, and in this, this is the only way, I think, that you can reach something like, uh, as powerful as uh, Lisp does in Python. And there is a library, which I'm going to, I, I don't have time to show because I knew it was too much. There is a library called MacroPy where you can actually do things like that. And this is valid Python. Even my syntax highlighter doesn't think it is, but it will run and it will work. And you can make a case class where you declare, uh, declare a class like that, passing X and Y. And this automatically will create uh, uh, in it with uh, X and Y, and you can just instantiate it like that and everything will work correctly. And that's how it's implemented. So if you want to look it up, it's called MacroPy. So yeah, that's it for me. So any questions? And then just the conclusion, sorry. Uh, well, metaprogramming is fun. You can make uh, in just one fit in one slide the code to create a very simple style ORM. And then just be careful, but uh, yeah, use it. If you would be confident that the programmer who will maintain your code yeah. will be a certified psychopath and serial killer, mm. would you still be using metaprogramming? Um, yeah, sorry. If I knew that the maintainer might be a psychopath and serial killer, would I still be using metaprogramming? Uh, yes, but I would comment it, maybe leave out my name. Or, uh, or change the history of Git to make sure it doesn't come to me. Yeah. Another question? Do you think the metaprogramming facilities in Python are enough, or would you call for more? I think uh, the philosophy of Python is that you shouldn't do things that are too unreadable and too hard to understand, so it would kind of go against the, the language uh, design to, to add more, and I don't know what really you could. But there are things, you can do crazy things like MacroPy does, so it is possible already, it's just, I think it's enough, and I wouldn't think you need more than that, yeah. Yeah, thank you.